Hey, welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage at RSA 2023. It's theCUBE, four days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Dave Vellante's here. We're breaking it all down from the as security changes. It's got cloud, you got network, you got threat detection, all that's happening within platforms and tools. The industry is changing very, very fast. We've got two great guests here to break it down for us. Derek Menke is the Chief Security Strategist, Global VP of Threat Intelligence with Fortinet's FortiGuard Labs. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on, Derek. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me again. John Baker, Director and Co-Founder of Center for Threat Informed Defense at MITRE and Ingenuity, great to see you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, you guys are the experts on threat detection, so are we under threat right now? What's happening in the network? What's are they all secure right now? So, <laughs> there's been a lot that, that changes on a daily basis, right? But if I were to look at what's happening, I mean, it, there's always a threat, right? Just like we have it in the, in the physical world, it's never going to go away. And in fact, cyber criminals and adversaries are getting more clever, yeah. right? We've talked about this before, but what are the innovations? One, we're actually seeing less of a push on volume, because it's been all about volume before. Everyone, you know, you walk around RSA, everybody talks about millions or billions or trillions of attacks. It's not so much about that, but what we're seeing now is attacks becoming much more uh, premeditated, tar targeted in nature. From cyber criminals, right? Focusing on rec reconnaissance, weaponization techniques, adding new TTPs and tactics, things that MITRE you yeah. know, tracks through attack as an example. That's what really what they're focusing yeah. on because it's more efficient, going after large enterprise, um, you know, the, the, yeah. the, um, the profits are higher for cyber criminals. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing them adopt, when I say them, cyber criminals now adopting yeah. or acting very much like, like APT groups. So yes, I would <laughs> say we're under threat because the threats are becoming always more, more targeted in nature. Yeah. Uh, right? For yeah. the folks watching, we do a lot of segments with Fortinet. They come up with all kinds of information, always checking in on us, taking care of us. But the big co collaboration conversation, John, I want to get into it, and is about sharing information. Collaboration in the industry is a big part of this RSA. What do you guys do over there, Mitre? Take a minute to explain what you do, and then talk about the, the role of how people are collaborating yeah. in security. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so here we are at RSA, the theme stronger together, right? And I think that that theme could eventually be, it could be our tagline at the Center for Threat Informed Defense. Um, at the Center for Threat Informed Defense, what we try to do is bring together sophisticated cybersecurity teams mm -hmm. uh, from around the world to identify and solve hard problems. And we do that with you know, Fortinet and Derek as one of our research partners there. Um, coming together, bringing in this diversity of perspectives, diversity of, kind of the challenges we face to hit what are the most impactful problems that we can solve and how do we do that in a way that helps the entire community. Right, you know, Derek was talking about sort of reuse of adversary TTPs. Well, you know, at the same way, we ought to figure out how to de defend against those TTPs and have that common library of defensive techniques and, and enable defenders to leverage that resource. And, and the relationship between yep. you and Fortinet is what? Partners? Oh, okay. Um, so, the Center for Threat Informed Defense is a nonprofit. Um, our mission is to advance threat informed defense globally. We have 30 member organizations, a couple of different tiers. Fortinet is one of our research partners or member of the Center for Threat Informed Defense. They work with us. You know, I say we collaborate in four ways at the Center for Threat Informed Defense. We collaborate on what we do, how we do it, actually doing the work, and, and actually sharing in the funding for the research program. So awesome. Derek, Derek has a huge role in I want to get your take on this. Yeah. We've had many chats on theCUBE. You guys are <laughs> very adamant. You're on the grid. You guys are watching everything. You share it publicly. Mm -hmm. This is a big part of the collaboration, the sharing, but also getting the data. Yes, getting the data and getting it right. There's a lot of data out yeah. there, right? And so I actually look at the, the work that we're doing and what, uh, and what the center is doing is advancing the, it's really the backbone, right? You have to get this right. It has to be structured, it has to be designed, mm -hmm. eventually standardized, right? Um, open, open source, open to the public, mm -hmm. things that are up on GitHub as an example. Make it available to the industry so that uh, it can be adopted because otherwise it's a high barrier, right? I mean, you can give me a, a data lake <laughs> and say, Derek, do something with this. <laughs> I might have my own ideas. <laughs> you know, it's a game of telephone a lot yeah, of the yeah. times, right? So without having uh, languages obviously uh, in place and the frameworks and the way to do that, um, innovative ideas, that's, yeah. that's the way we need to move forward, especially because that data, the co contextual data we talk about all the time, it's becoming more vast, right? <laughs> because yeah. there's you know, more TTPs that we talked about, yeah. no, more techniques, a bigger attack surface. It's not just yeah. IPs and URL addresses oh, and yeah. hashes it's we're It's talking gotten about. complex and you're seeing some of the, even with the AI and the machine learning stuff happening, more advanced stuff there. The attack surface area is changing. What are the current trends that you guys are seeing right now as we speak in 2023? We're, you know, we're in the spring. Um, what's the current state of the art? What are some things out there? Are threats start leaving signatures, for instance, with the new AI? You're seeing patterns. What kind of trends are we seeing on the threat landscape? 
So I'll, I'll, I'll start with that, maybe John can give some comments yeah. after. You yeah. know, from, from my point of view, a couple of things. I mentioned, first of all, the targeted mm -hmm. attacks. Uh, uh, playbooks like ransomware now incorporating destructive techniques. That's one trend. Uh, you know, we issue our threat landscape report and that was one yeah. of the highlight trends yeah. in it, right? So things that were born out of APT, wiper malware, destructive attacks, uh, particularly in OT, right? That's a yeah. big, big thing. We're seeing it all across the boards in healthcare manufacturing. OT was supposed to be locked down, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you yeah, got Windows kind of 7 uh, <laughs> operating system? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is like infrastructure well, issue. Well, okay. Those are the IHMIs yeah. and yeah. IT, but now those OT networks, it's all, you know, a lot of them are not segmented, yeah. they're all connected. So that is a big uh, aspect of threat. Speaking of AI as well too, uh, we have seen some implementations of uh, AI for the use of phishing techniques, social engineering. To be honest, when it comes to things like malware development and stuff like that, um, a lot of the, the code and, and techniques still work. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of that low-hanging fruit out there, mm -hmm. but um, you know, there's most likely going to be some advances. Are you seeing that. any specific, Dave and I were just riffing on this at our opening yeah. uh, yesterday and today. Are there signatures with the AI yet? Or is it the same old malware tricks, just ample, easier to code, five versions of malware, see which one sticks, or is there specific AI-like signatures coming in that are now first generation kind of patterns, or is well, it not yeah. yet? Well, so, yeah, so with machine learning techniques, uh, you can actually do predictive analysis and you can have zero day mitigation from a, from a defensive point of view. And, and so it's yeah. a valid way to, you know, again, it's it's a lot, if you look at things like uh, polymorphism, we call it viruses changing, right? Um, you know, mm. it's becoming less trivial to detect those. So with machine learning patterns and, and being able to anticipate even brand new kits that are being developed yeah. from, you know, borrowed libraries from past code techniques. It's, it's, um, John, what are you seeing? We were yeah. talking on the threats earlier about got to fight fire with fire, so. You know, just kind of building off something Derek just said there. You know, one of the, the, the projects that we launched recently within the Center for Threat and Foreign Defense was this project called Attack Flow. Yeah. And you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, over the last few years, you've probably seen this trend of organizations shifting from, you know, kind of chasing indicators of compromise or IOCs towards understanding adversary behaviors and trying to figure out how to defend against those behaviors, yeah. kind of moving up the, the pyramid of pain, right? Um, so with attack flow, what we've done is we've created a model for you to capture and describe a sequence of adversary behaviors, right? So if you're an incident responder and you're investigating something, um, you can start to describe exactly what you've seen in that incident, and that then creates this much higher fidelity conversation back with your Intel team. So now instead of you know talking about several IOCs that you saw, yeah. you can talk about the set of behaviors and the details underneath that behavior that, that probably do include an IOC, right? And if, the benefits there is the accelerated prevention, right? Well, well what happens or is it actually allows you to start to leverage that corpus of flows and do things like predictive intelligence to understand, you know, if I'm doing threat hunting, what should I look for next if I see a behavior and be much smarter about that? It should allow us to create you know, much more resilient uh, detection capabilities. So instead of focusing on detecting a particular IOC or one specific behavior, we can start to focus on de detecting sequences of behaviors. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you start to think about you know, other opportunities for automation there. It gives you this foundation for um, you know, potentially looking into how, how do we attribute attacks? You know, yes, does this yeah. attack look like other attacks that we've seen? Capabilities, right. and, and there's so many advantages, yeah. like from, yeah, he mentioned like the SOC and the analyst perspective, but this also goes all the way up. I mean, Absolutely. it's in the names, uh, threat informed defense. That's <laughs> yeah. what it's about. Yeah, it yeah. can go all the way up to the CISO level, right? Saying, okay, now that I know these playbooks or how these adversaries are moving through yeah. the networks, given a, 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 you know, a period of patterns in the past, this is what we can anticipate. And then, again, from a CISO hat, uh, do I have gaps, right? Yeah. What are the assets that are most likely to attack? How are they going to do that? Do I have the, the right preventative measures in I place? I think this is the most important area. This is, this is where the hard work yep. doesn't look sexy, but it really pays off huge. Because so you think about the value of that. Yeah, you know, what I say within the Center for Threat and Foreign Events, when we're doing really well, we're often building resources, capabilities that kind of lay a foundation for innovation for the whole community. Um, you know, our goal is to essentially make cyber defense more efficient and more effective, right? Mm. Something like attack flow, it creates this model. There's some immediate value there to, you know, individual security teams to be able, being able to communicate more effectively, but it also creates a foundation for uh, cybersecurity companies and security yeah. teams to really innovate on top of. Yeah. Can so. you give some examples without naming names or name names where you've seen it play out in a positive ex experience for, for companies as you get more of this, as you're fighting the cyber crime, you got, you know, you're trying to prevent it. 
Because those are almost private victories. When you prevent something, it didn't happen. So it's like yeah. you're celebrating right. something that didn't happen. <laughs> That's, you know? that's the hardest thing, uh, <laughs> is uh, capturing those success stories in, in a way that people are willing to share. Look, we didn't get hacked today. <laughs> <laughs> Beers for everyone. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, but no, so this is work that need to get, needs to get done. Does. What, what does success look like? Just peace and... and, and so we, I, I'll, I'll let you start with that. All right, sure, I'll, I'll go for it. You yeah. know, like, honestly, uh, that's very close to, to the charter for the Center for Threat and Foreign Defense. Our mission is to advance threat and foreign defense globally. Why do we do that? Um, we kind of use this image. Imagine um, the sort of miter attack knowledge base, that matrix that everybody's familiar with is like the game board for the adversary. Yeah. We want to take safe spaces off the game board. We want to make it harder for adversaries yeah. to achieve their goals. We want to, as we go, create risk for the adversary. So um, ultimately it's about trying to bring balance to that equation between yeah. defense and, and yeah. the and adversaries. The inform and being informed is critical. Exactly. Yeah, and, and to me success is, is um, growing that ecosystem, industry adoption, including mm -hmm. ourselves, right, at Fortinet, but really leading the charge, moving the needle as an industry, because stronger together, like the theme that we have at the conference, yeah. that's how we do it, right? I, yeah. I, I describe this as literally the backbone yeah. of how we do this, right? So that's one step, mm -hmm. but then how do you transport that? How do you get uh, implementation of yeah. that? How do you get all that messaging going up to CISOs worldwide? You know, that that's success, right? Well, yeah. we have to get you on our podcast. Dave and I have a new podcast. It's on our eighth episode. We're trying. Okay. To, we're going to bring a guest in after ten episodes. Mm -hmm. But this is one that we've been ranting about: public-private partnerships uh -huh. in action that actually help society, yeah. not just aren't political check yeah. boxes. And our government is failing at many levels. So like, we we go on the rant. So we have yeah, to get yeah. you guys in. But <laughs> let's get, let's talk about the the partnership because this has to happen. We've got to get more sharing, not mm -hmm. get dogmatic yeah. around the islands everyone lives in the unification of the data becomes uh -huh. super critical. Yep. Can you share your thoughts on, on this important item? It's critically important, I think. So from a sharing perspective, as I said, you got to get it right. Everybody has different use cases, right? You have to be able to articulate that. You have to be flexible. You have to respect privacy, of course, through all those things in. But have, you know, we, we need to break down uh, um, silos, right? There's a lot of silos, uh, siloed sharing efforts that are happening out there. So we need to enable public, uh, private to private sector mm -hmm. sharing. Uh, we do that through our fabric ecosystem as an example of Fortinet, but uh, public and uh, uh, public private as well yeah. too, right? All the way up to law enforcement, prosecution, we, we've said we can't arrest our way out of this problem, but it's all part of the ecosystem, yeah. and guess what? All of that has a direct impact on the citizen, on the consumer as well, too, right? Um, and in fact, the consumer also, if you think yeah. about you know, these networks and, and you know, implementing a good security stack, resilient networks, that's all part of that as well, I had a too. huge argument with the New York Times cyber writer who covers the cybersecurity, and I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, and she, her whole thing is, nobody died. I'm like, well, you can't measure, just like someone dropped a missile. <laughs> the, the cyber war is under the red line. They're operating freely, and there's, there are people dying from you know, starvation because they got laid off or whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of impact downstream. If there's not yet, the doctrine is not yet solved. I think we need more, my, I'm a hawk on this. I'm like more private public conversations around the benefit mm -hmm. of protection. You know, so I think there's this other thing too that, that's actually, it's in, I think, incredibly simple. You know, we want to make cyber defense more efficient and, if, and more effective, right? And if you want to become more efficient, you need to kind of recognize that, you know, you don't you don't need to have a half dozen or hundreds of teams solving the same problem in isolation, right? Um, within the center's research program, that was kind of one of our motivators. We had organizations reaching out to us saying, we're looking at this particular problem, is anybody else yeah. doing it? And yeah. we knew of others, and like, well let's get together and solve that together once, benefit from each other's perspective to hopefully solve it better, right? And let's make that available for the whole community. And so some of the, the stuff yeah. we've done, it, it's created a foundational resource that's used by yeah. literally thousands of security teams around the world. They don't have to go do that work. They can go focus yeah. on defense now yeah. rather than creating some of these foundational resources. Yeah. And it's the and a game changer. And the productivity too. Derek, we yeah. were talking earlier many times on your thing about yeah. cyber crime as a service, yes. how the actors are highly motivated, highly funded, highly technical, mm -hmm. and they're constantly innovating and they're good. They're motivated, yeah. there's money involved. So how do you make it tougher? Exactly. This you, is, you, is, is got to break that. We, we we have to lower the barrier on our side and raise the barrier on their side. That's how we yeah, do it, right? Yeah. That's how we make it tougher. And by the way, this isn't a one-shot thing. It's not like, hey, we yeah. had a great conversation. Let's revisit this in a year. Uh, this has to be literally yeah. a five to ten plus year roadmap. How things that we're in the long haul for. How do people get involved? Because I know I know a lot of security professionals and network professionals. The two hardest personalities to work with, frankly, in the industry. No, I'm only kidding. Um, <laughs> but they're all very open. But then operations gets 
paranoia around operations. <laughs> How much do I want to share? Yeah. So they're, they're very shareable sharing culture. Uh, open source yeah. has been very sharing culture. We're now in an era where the sharing is the critical piece. Mm -hmm. How do people get involved and how do they move the needle? Yeah, well, so uh, within the Center for Threat and Foreign Defense, one of the, the reasons we built ourselves and kind of designed the business model the way we did was we wanted to kind of identify the barriers to collaboration and kind of knock all of those down. Um, so we, our kind of motto is we kind of deal with that pain up front. We have a membership agreement, you join as a member. And that handles, how do you, how do you handle intellectual property? How do you deal with sharing sensitive information? Yeah. And so, you know, if you join as a member, you're now under this common framework for doing collaborative R&D, so that we can then, instead of worrying about legalese and, and that sort of yeah. thing, we can focus on what's the next problem to solve and put our resources and effort there, right? And so we've tried to create this very scalable model so we can continually tackle the next hard problem, continually release that that resource as a public um, good that all cybersecurity teams can leverage and build upon. Yeah, and I would say um, it depends, right? Like if we're yeah. talking about, it depends on the resource. So going back to yeah. the skills gap, right? Yeah. There's ways to solve this. We don't want to create redundancy. If we're talking about SMB, right? That doesn't have a SOC in place. They can get involved just simply by signing up to like yeah. SOC as a service or working with MSSPs and yeah. they don't have to get involved in, you know, intense data sharing and trying to, to set up APIs and model that because there's yeah. resources available for I'm that, glad right? you brought up SMB, one of the most vulnerable yeah. areas for ransomware right yeah. now. And they don't usually have that, that yeah. support and yeah. they need to have that. It's expensive, what's the cost structure around SMBs? Is there, is there services out there that yes, you can Yes, yeah, uh, there's a lot of services, yeah, absolutely. SOC is a service, we have, yeah. um, yeah. there's a, lo a lot of uh, cloud service models, network detection response, a lot of things available mm -hmm. that you don't have to go and, and make a huge OPEX about it, right, and hiring 10 headcount yeah. in your SOC as an example. But then, going to the large enterprise, the mature SOC that do have resource and headcount, they can get involved. Yeah. Uh, we do this, right? We have a lot of one-to-one uh, -one relationships, and they're all different. Right, saying, and they're scoping calls, saying how would you like to share, what kind of information do you have, how can we work, what's going to be actionable on your side, identifying that yeah. and be flexible with it. Those are the, you, they're conversations you have to have. John, I got to ask you over there in the threat detection department, what's the coolest thing you're working on right now um, from a technology or threat yeah. research, because you know, the stakes are high, adrenaline must get pump, pumping big time when yeah. you're in these, in these yeah. moments. So I, I'm really lucky. I think that we've, we've built this model that allows us to kind of continually tackle the next problem, right? So today we're running seven projects actively you know, that eventually will result in some public resource, right? And so just that in itself is, is really fun and energizing for me. Um, I think the project that I'm most excited about, um, it's a project that we've called CTI Blueprints, or Cyber Threat Intel Blueprints. What we're trying to do is work kind of upstream to help um, all of those organizations that create excellent threat intel products make those much more actionable mm -hmm. and easier for consumers downstream to actually do something with. And so yeah. the project puts together some guidance, some templates, some tooling to help threat intel producers create those actionable resources. Yeah. Um, I really hope that that'll be uh, the start of a, sort of a larger change <laughs> towards making threat intel awesome. easier to operationalize across awesome. all security teams. I mean, the so. trusted intelligence yeah. coming out is key. Put a plug in for the organization. What are you looking for? Take a minute yeah. to, to put a plug in for what you're working on. So yeah, we're, we're a nonprofit. We work together with our members to advance threat informed defense across the globe, right? And we're looking for a set of very sophisticated security teams to come work with us. I'm very much looking to increase our sector and geographic diversity. If people are, yeah. you know, you kind of think about yourselves as a very sophisticated team <laughs> that's interested in supporting, you know, public interest research, would love to talk with you. And then the thing is we've also released 24 different projects yeah. at this point. Those are out and freely available. Um, I very much want people to take yeah. them, use them. Yeah. That's what makes our work impactful, is when people pick them up and use them. Well, I would just put it in my own personal opinion. I think communities, when they come together, yeah. have a common intelligence, yeah. and with AI, you, I'm sure you'll power a lot of core data, blueprints, policies, yeah. workflows, that can be leveraged in with, with industry. Yeah. And it's a, I think this is going to be the beginning of what I would call the open sharing culture that's going to be on open source software, which we know a lot about. Yeah. Yep. I like the word community. I also, um, I want to highlight that there's there's a good track record here. There's <laughs> hope, right? Because yeah. when we look at MITRE ATT&CK, it's, it's yeah. implemented yeah. worldwide and pervasive. It's, it's pervasive, yeah. right? Yep. And this yeah. is something that, it's a model that, that's shown to work, it's adopted, and these everything we've been talking about yeah. is all building on top yeah. of that, right? I think, I think yeah. the idea of the public-private partnership and being open is the future. Uh -huh. uh, we've seen it with software. Yep. And we've seen it with yep. security now. You guys are doing it. This is the right direction. It's the only way to go because think about the collective intelligence of yeah. the community working together. Yeah. 
Let's, think. It, it, let's, let's uh, come together. We're yeah, as you know, awesome. stronger together, work yeah. together. We can identify and solve the right and most pressing problems, yeah. do it better, and have a much greater impact. And this, right? this is something that has been core to us with FortiGuard Labs yeah. as well. We've been doing public-private partnerships yeah. for well over a decade, yeah. um, and the good news is it's uh, it's continuing to get stronger now. Right? Yeah. There's there's more stakeholders, there's more interest, there's more yeah. tools and technologies yeah. and frameworks to help with. And that your too. Fortinet uh, report is is legendary, and uh -huh. we appreciate your quarterly updates on the. Q Yes, Appreciate absolutely, yes, and we'll keep yeah, them yeah. coming. We have awesome. a lot of that data, absolutely. Yeah, and it's super getting out there. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, Derek, yeah. John, Thank thanks for, yeah. for sharing Thank you. all the metadata here on theCUBE for you to enjoy some more coverage from RSA. Threat detection, actionable, trust, community, this is the code words for better together, <laughs> this is theCUBE, better together here at RSA. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>